and on our social media platforms, including voaafrica.com. Our hashtags tonight are Zim Decides, hashtag ZTN, hashtag election debate, hashtag VOA. Now let's introduce you to our panel, if you haven't recognized them already. Starting um, with uh, our first uh, panelist will be Mr. Tendai Biti, uh, the MDC Alliance representative, um, whose uh, MDC Alliance is uh, represented by presidential candidate, advocate Nelson Chamisa. Uh, good evening, Mr. Biti. And then second, we have Dr. Nkosana Moyo. He is the presidential candidate for the Alliance for People's Agenda, APA. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Good evening. And then we also have Professor Love Momaduku, presidential candidate for the National Constitutional Assembly. Welcome to the platform. Thank you. And uh, last but in no means least, Ambassador Chris Mutrangwa, representing the ruling party ZANU PF. Um, he's uh, the pres which is the presidential the, and the presidential candidate for the party is the incumbent president Emerson Munangagwa. Welcome. Good evening, Zimbabwe and the world. Now, before we start, just a few rules so we all know how this is going to work. Um, as you know, we have all sat, uh, gentlemen, on various platforms and had discussions before. Tonight, we have a bit of a format that we're hoping you'll be able to follow. What we're going to do is um, we're going to start by offering each of you two minutes in which to speak and um, talk about yourselves as well as your parties. Um, thereafter, there will be um, a, a chance for you to answer for a minute and a half. And then now uh, we'll also then, um, each time that you're asked a question, you will only be allowed two minutes to speak at a time. So each time a question comes to you, whether from us as your hosts or from the audience, it will be only two minutes in which you can answer. So I hope that we can all adhere to that so that we can get as much covered. We've got many topics we want to discuss with you tonight as we prepare to understand what each of your parties are offering Zimbabwe. So if you can comply, I'm sure we'll get through quite a number of these key issues. And to our live audience tonight, um, don't um, forget that we will note your questions as well. As you heard, your first round of questions have already been taken in. And when inspired by what the panelists are saying, we will take a second round um, that will allow you to, to, to bring forward to us and then we'll bring those forward to them. Um, so um, all the other rules, etiquettes, um, we hope that we can have a very mature and respectable debate tonight. Um, particularly to our panelists, the gentlemen, we know that sometimes these national issues um, they sit hard on your hearts, and um, we don't at all discourage you from being passionate, but we do encourage you to be respectful. And I hope that the audience can adhere to the same. So, let's begin now with our first candidate um, to give their one minute, 30 second personal party profile, Dr. Nkosana Moyo. Uh, Nkosana Moyo. Uh, I'm uh, 67 years old now. Uh, I lead APA, the Alliance for the People's Agenda, and I'm the presidential candidate. My working life has been in the private sector, finance in particular, investment, investment banking, commercial banking, and private equity. I would like to think that, and that has been broadly on the African continent, working in the UK as well as in the US. APA uh, is a new party, started last year, when we recognized that our country is not going very far in terms of looking after the interests of our people. We felt something new was required, and what we offer as APA is, is in our manifesto, which was developed in very close consultation with the population of this country. And the name of our party actually talks to our approach to the politics that we believe in, Alliance for the People's Agenda. In other words, we are driven by very closely listening to what people are saying to us. That's how we developed our, our uh, manifesto. Our manifesto has got five pillars to it. The first one is constitutionalism. And I have jokingly said often that if all of the parties in Zimbabwe had read the constitution, actually, we should not have wasted money writing all of those manifestos, we should just have put one sentence only. We will abide by the provisions of the Constitution because our Constitution, although it's not perfect like anything else, actually covers everything we need to do. It covers everything. So constitutionalism. The second issue is that Zimbabwe is a very divided nation. So we need a leader 
who can unite our country, our population, and form a genuine nation in order for us to apply our energies in a united way to overcome our challenges. So that's the second one. The third one is meritocracy. At the moment, our country is run by people who are selected on the basis of nepotism, cronyism, and patronage. We don't select and field our best team, our best brains. And we, in consultation with the population, have come to the conclusion that if we did just that thing alone, observe that if you want to win, you field the best brains possible, would we'll do very well. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nkosana Moyo. And over to you now, Mr. Tendai Biti. Thank you, Nico. Uh, my name is Tendai Biti. I'm a human rights lawyer, um, uh, a, a founding member of uh, the Movement for Democratic Change, and now a principal uh, in the MDC Alliance. Uh, standing in on behalf of uh, Advocate Nelson Chamisa, uh, who is uh, our leader. Uh, the MGC Alliance's uh, thrust is very simple. We want to end and undo uh, 38 years uh, of uh, decay, of uh, collapse, of an indifferent, uh, cruel rule uh, based on uh, patronage uh, 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 and neo-patrimonialism. We anchor our policy document, uh, SMART, the Sustainable Modernization Agenda for Real Transformation on three key issues, uh, transformation, uh, opportunity, and uh, prosperity. Uh, we consider that uh, the transformation of our country is critical, the transformation of the governance uh, uh, culture, the transformation of the governance uh, infrastructure. Uh, so we concentrate on things such as uh, devolution, concentrate on things such as dealing with the corrosive agenda uh, of corruption that is in our body uh, 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 politic. Uh, we intend to transform our economy. And our key uh, tenet is, number one, to bring back uh, macroeconomic uh, stability uh, in Zimbabwe, is to build a, a $100 billion economy within the course of the next uh, uh, 10 years, uh, is to construct an economy which provides employment to our people, given that 95% of our people uh, are unemployed. It is to build a, a, a country with a strong uh, social agenda. And one of the things which we intend to do is to make a basic uh, education a right by ensuring that uh, primary education is uh, free uh, to every, uh, to every uh, child. It is also uh, you know, intended to build a rights-based uh, society. Citizens must have uh, 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 full rights, and therefore the agenda of ensuring that uh, constitutionalism and the rule of law are abided to by the citizen uh, will be key. Thank uh, you, Mr. Beatty. Thank you very much. And over to you, Professor Love Momaduku. My name is Love Momaduku. I'm the leader of the NCA, uh, standing in for National Constitutional Assembly. It's a new political party that came in from being a civic organization. And this is the first general election in which we are participating as a political party with a presidential candidate and several members of parliament. Our aim is to make Zimbabwe a prosperous and democratic country. The NCA's philosophy is empowerment of ordinary people, those that are marginalized and impoverished. We believe that the country is where it is today because it has allowed an undemocratic culture and that undemocratic culture has been centered on our constitution. Uh, unlike other players, we actually believe that the current constitution of Zimbabwe is an undemocratic document and that uh, when we get an opportunity, Zimbabweans must write a new constitution that is centered on their real and genuine aspirations. We believe that uh, we need to provide a clean government. The current governance framework in our country is based on a corrupt uh, mentality that believes that what political leaders must do is to enrich themselves and that to use the power that they have solely for that. This is not peculiar to those that are in the ruling party. We believe that we also have politicians in the opposition that are anchored 
on ensuring that politics is about enriching themselves. So ours is to provide a genuine and clean uh, government, and a clean government that is clearly focused on the wishes of the poor and others. So we would say that the NCA philosophy is social justice, based on what we call social democracy. The state must exist for those that are powerless, and that's what we intend to do. Thank you, sir. All right, and uh, Ambassador Chris Mutranga. Thank you very much, Mr. Nepo. I am Christopher Mutangwa, Special Advisor to the President. My party is Zanukia, it is the party of the incumbent. We are the party of history, we are the party of the record, we are the party of the future. Uh, it was interesting to hear of the aspirations which are being expressed by the three gentlemen about their various parties. We just want to put it on record that uh, Hello, I'm Dimiake Mokalieli, and here we are in the Washington, D.C. studios of Straight Talk Africa. Of course, you're watching a live um, debate that is taking place right now in Harare, which is moderated between VOA's Shaka Sali, of course, of Straight Talk Africa, and ZTN, the Zim Papers uh, TV network, uh, who is being, and is being moderated by Ruben Eko we're experiencing a little bit of uh, technical problems. I'm sure you're, on, you're hearing a little bit of a buzz in your ear, but we are trying to resolve it. Meantime, just to let you know what is happening right now, there is um, a debate taking place at the Crown Plaza in Harare called The Elected, the presidential debate. Uh, among the panelists who are currently being featured is, uh, uh, of course, Mr. Love Momaduku, the NCA party. Tendai Biti, who is uh, sitting on, in, on part for the uh, MDC Alliance. And then also there is um, Ambassador Christopher Mchangwa. He's representing uh, ZANU-PF. And then there's also Nkosana Moyo, who is a presidential candidate for APA. So the discussion is ongoing. There are a lot of uh, issues that are going to be raised during this, this discussion. The debate has just started, so most of the presenters or the panelists are just sharing their, their, uh, their manifestos and uh, giving a sense of what they plan to do for Zimbabwe. We'll be back. So entertained. Um, thank you very much, gentlemen, for your opening remarks. And uh, over to you, Shagasali, for our first questions to you as we debate tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, let me go to um, Ambassador Muchangwa again. Ambassador Muchangwa, your party, yes. ZANU PF. The last time I checked, it has been in power for 38 years. Yes. Could you please tell us what you think is the single most important decision that has been made during the last 38 years? And two, the single most regrettable decision during that period? The single most important decision we made, I think, was soon after independence when we said everybody should go to school. Uh, the IMF and the World Bank uh, looked at our budget at that time in 1980, and they concluded that we didn't have enough resources to send everybody to school. But we, being uh, the part which organized the people for a massive military engagement unseen in Africa by, uh, uh, by any African country against a modern army, we then advised the government to use the little budget which they had to pay teachers. So, and we went to organize the parents in the various villages all over the countryside to build schools for free. Uh, there was a competition between the government supplying software it was the teachers, because that's what we told the government to do, to pay the teachers with that little budget. And, we, and the parents supplying the hardware. The parents won. Each time there were more schools being built than teachers could be supplied by the central government. We then moved on to address that issue by going back to our guerrilla training camps in Cuba and converted them to teacher training schools. 6,000 teachers were trained in Cuba so that the government could catch up with the frenetic pace which the people of Zimbabwe were building in schools. Today, we're the most educated country in Africa. UNESCO standards say so, even ahead of countries which went earlier into independence. A very literate, capable population, which when it goes to foreign countries, it earns hard currency 
just like anybody who is doing those foreign countries. This is a singular achievement which is based on the history of organization by Zanu PF. No African country could aspire to do that the way we did it. So sending people, making them be active citizens in a modern globalized society is what we achieved most. The worst decision was the persistence in having a geriatric becoming president until he felt that he could turn this country into a Mugabesia, like Rose had done. Rose had turned this country into a Rodoesia. Mugabe wanted to turn it into a Mugabesia. And obviously, we, we, the war veterans and others, we had to challenge that. And we delivered the change which the other parties had aspired to and failed over a period of time. So, thank, thank you, you Ambassador. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. Just a reminder that um, when we, as your hosts, interject, we are not being rude in any way. We did um, outline the ground rules that your questions will be given two minutes to answer and any follow-up questions will be given one minute to answer. So please do comply with us when we do stop you. It is because your time is up. Um, Thank coming you. Coming to... to um, Professor Maduku. Right. What about you, Professor Maduku? What would you say that... Uh, so far, uh, during your private uh, uh, life, what would you say has been the single most important decision? And about, what about the single most regrettable decision during your public life? Well, I would say that the single most important decision that I made in my private life is the, that's what you're asking, is the decision to go to school, uh, ensure that I pursue studies uh, in a way that would um, empower me as an individual and be able to confront the challenges that uh, everyone else has to, fa to, to face. You have to start on that basis. That is what I would say would be the most important decision that I made. Um, the single most regrettable decision, if I may say so, would be the decision not to have entered politics earlier uh, uh, than now. Uh, I, I didn't then enter politics uh, early in the 2000 when we founded the movement for democratic change. I think that if I had entered politics, I would have changed uh, the direction of the opposition at the time. So I regret not having done that. Thank you very much. Uh, what about you, Mr. Bitti? Well, I think that uh, the most important thing which we ever did as uh, MTC was the decision itself uh, to form a movement uh, way back uh, in uh, 1999. Um, we had watched our country uh, go to the dogs, literally and metaphorically. We had watched the standards of our living uh, collapse. We had watched the hygiene in our country uh, collapse. Uh, we had watched uh, the social indices, maternal mortality rates, infant mortality rates, uh, uh, collapse. Uh, and so uh, we had tried to express our anger, our frustration through trade union efforts, uh, you know, student movements, which both Love Moy and I were part of, uh, through NGOs, including the NCA, which uh, is now a political uh, party. Uh, and of course through uh, the Zimbabwe Congress of Trade Unions. And of course the state, including President Mugabe, cynically retorted to us and say, the demands you are making are now political, please form your own political party. So it was a bold decision uh, to form uh, a political party uh, in uh, 1999 pursuant to the National Working People's Convention uh, that was held on the 26th of February, 1999. We gave our people hope we gave our people a chance, and we are in the trenches uh, today, uh, giving our people the expectation, the belief that we will change our country fundamentally. I think the regret we have uh, is possibly around uh, the, the GNU uh, of 2008. We won the election in 2008, and we accepted. Uh, there was a summit that was held uh, at Mulungushi International Conference Center in Zambia uh, on the 14th of uh, April uh, 2008. That summit came to the conclusion that we were supposed to go to a runoff uh, on the 28th of June. 
but this was before the presidential result had been announced. And the presidential result would only be announced six weeks later on the 5th of May. So I think our decision to accept a runoff mm. in an election which we had clearly won was wrong. Mm. We allowed stability to take over democracy, and that was a mistake which we made. Thank you very much. What about uh, you, Dr. Moyo? So the best decision I've ever made, I don't know whether you are aware that in year 2000, I allowed myself to join a ZANU cabinet. I was invited by the president and agreed to join. I was not a member of the party. I think it's the most important decision I've ever made because it allowed me to see the beast from inside. So when, when, I, when I listen today to ZANU people talking, I know how they function. I'm, it's not theory. I've got first-hand experience of how incapable they are. <laughs> so that was, I mean, I only spent 10 months in that cabinet, but it is the most important decision I've ever made in my life. You know, I've got a philosophical position which makes it difficult to answer the flip side of your question. In my opinion, there is no single uh, bad decision I've ever made. Because every decision I've made has left me wiser and more aware of the world around me. So even things that have appeared to be hateful, that were painful, actually have left me a better person. So there is no bad decision I've ever made. Even the, those that have hurt me, they've been good decisions. Thank you very much. So, uh, Coming back to you, gentlemen, on another point. Looking at the landscape we're in now, we have elections on the 30th of July, on Monday. And uh, some of you as uh, parties have objected the operations of the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission. Some of you as parties have not. Um, coming first to um, uh, Mr. Tendai Biti, as the MDC Alliance, you have been making the headlines and you have been the loudest voice in opposing the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission. First question would be, are you ready and are you participating in Monday's elections? Second question would be, do you accept the outcome of the elections, whatever that outcome might be? We are definitely uh, participating uh, in the election on Monday. There's no question about that. It's good. But there is no doubt that uh, the Zimbabwe Election Commission is, is a captured institution. There's no doubt that they have not been partial. They have no doubt that their conduct and operations have been uneven and unequal. We are going into an election on, on Monday, but there's been no agreement and no transparency around the ballot uh, paper. In, in no more countries, there has to be full disclosure on the ballot paper, its status, its traceability, its security, where is it coming from, where is it going to, the distribution. That basic elementary uh, issue has not been uh, disclosed to us. We are going into an election on Monday. Up until now, ZEC has not allowed and provided to political parties a voter's row that complies with Section 23 of uh, the Electoral Act. And Section 23 says they've got a duty to provide free of charge a voter's row in searchable and analyzable uh, form. And now they are creating this fiction that uh, uh, we cannot disclose the biometric uh, voter's row and the biometric features because your picture is private. But it is not private. It is your vote uh, that is uh, uh, you know, private. So we find that totally absurd. We're going to an election on Monday, uh, uh, when a few days ago, a few weeks ago, there's been massive abuse of postal voting. Postal voting was designed for a few people on, in diplomatic missions. Now it has been converted into a full-scale uh, uh, full uh, election. So notwithstanding uh, these issues, we will participate in this election. There is the, the, the second part of your question is clear. People of Zimbabwe have spoken and are speaking. You have seen the massive turnouts of people at our, at our 
uh, at our rallies and meetings. Zimbabwe is ready for change. And I think it is going to be unacceptable that you create an outcome that is not consistent with the election as the election is taking place uh, right now. So we will not allow a situation where uh, procedural uncertainty is used to create a predetermined uh, outcome. We will accept the genuine and legitimate feeling and expression of the people of Zimbabwe. And Thank our you. prayer, our prayer, Ruveneko, is that we've, we've been voting for 38 years, we've not elected. We hope that on Monday, the 30th of July, we'll vote and elect. Thank because you. the consequences for our country Thank you, will Mr. be drastic. Bitti. Thank you very much. Coming to Ambassador Mutangwa on the same topic of the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission, the Zanu PF party has been um, loudly silent on any discrepancies that are in the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission. The question would be, do you find any? And um, what then as well in terms of an outcome would you accept and not accept? Well, we come from the premise that ZEC is an independent commission which is set up by parliament uh, and parliamentarians who included the MDC were the ones who were instrumental in setting up ZEC, including the selection of a judge who at that time actually enjoyed a lot of favor with them. They are now finding issues with that judge. It is their quarrel between themselves and that judge. Uh, where ZANU-PF comes in as a party which has got uh, responsibility for law and order and the smooth running of the country is when a party decides to go extra constitutional, extra legal into the challenge of ZEC. They can quarrel as much as they like with ZEC. And being good lawyers, and they are Mr. Beach is a good lawyer, so is Mr. Chamisa, and so are many others in the MDC. You know, good lawyers take their cases to the judges. The good lawyers don't take their cases to the people in the street. So we hope that the, the, all these things, which the, a gamut of issues which they are raising with the, with the ZEC, time is still there between now and Monday. They can take it to the courts and have it resolved by the courts. Because that is the only place where those things should be resolved. As far as we are concerned, they are making uh, Judge Chibumba a candidate for this election when she is not on the ballot box. Mm -hmm. I don't know how they can campaign to the electorate or to their voters when they are not focusing on President E.G. and many other candidates. And they are trying to focus on Judge Chibumba. She will not be definitely on the ballot box. So they are missing the wood from the trees. That's that's the thing. That's what you can say about the And on the outcome, sir. Hello. On the outcome of the elections. We are happy with the outcome of the election, whichever way it comes. You know, it's a, the people of Zimbabwe decide in a vote, and the issue about money is people voting, putting their exes on whom they want to be the leader, and that is in a, according to the constitution which we went together with the MDC as the main political parties took it to the whole country. There was a referendum. Hello, this is Nimiake Mokalieli again here in Washington. We are sitting in the studios of The Voice of America. And this is part of Straight Talk Africa. Of course, it's a bit different from what you're normally used to. We are having a live debate right now in collaboration with the ZTN, the Zim Papers television network in Harare. There's a discussion on the elected, the presidential debate featuring some presidential candidates as well as representatives of presidential candidates. So we are here in the studio uh, paying attention. Unfortunately, right now we're having uh, some audio problems and that's why it was tossed back to us in the studio. And I have with me my colleagues Ray Choto and Praxenis Jeremiah of the VOA Zimbabwe Service. Of course, we're all following this uh, conversation intently. Um, interesting questions from Shaka and Ruveneko about, you know, regrets and, uh, you know, things that they, they don't regret. What, what takeaway do you have from the conversation, Ray? I mean, just to begin with, this is a very exciting uh, conversation that we're having. I think the first of its kind mm -hmm. where VOA is partnering with the Zimbabwean news organization. Yes. Yeah, the responses that I've got from, um, from uh, let's say, Dr. Nkosana Moyo, I mean, who joined the Zimbabwe government after he has been invited by, pres by then President Robert Mugabe for only 10 months. He said it gave him an opportunity to see how the Mugabe system operates mm -hmm. and how bad they were doing their business. Mm -hmm. So the interesting thing is that he left the government after 10 years, and we all know that Dr. Angosana Moyo did not really resign, but he just left the government and went to South Africa after 10 months. Right. And uh, 
somehow faxed his resignation letter right. to President Robert Mugabe. An interesting observation there. We go again to Love Mamaduku, who talks about having had the opportunity to go to school, mm -hmm. to get educated, and also to be at the forefront in terms of forming the National Constitutional Assembly, right. which then gave birth to the movement for democratic change, but regrets that he did not join the movement for democratic change when it was formed in 1999. Mm -hmm. And we go back again to Mr. Beatty, who talks about the GNU mm -hmm. in uh, 2008. Did you find After that revealing, what he revealed about the Mulungoshi Center and the decision that were made there for them to actually... I think for some of our listeners and viewers today, it could be something uh, new. But I mean, because we've been reading and studying, uh, we are quite sure about what really happened at Lubumbashi. We are quite sure about the debate that was within the MDC self not to be involved in the government of national unity immediately after they've realized that they have won. They won the parliamentary votes. But in, in, in that election, the MDC did not won a popular vote mm -hmm. in 2008 in the first round, mm -hmm. but it did win the majority yes. of parliamentary seats. And it's an issue we keep hearing recurrently. Of course, it's very unfortunate that the man at the time of the 2008 elections, the late Morgan Changirai, is no longer here. Precisely. And it's, a, it's a, I guess many would consider it quite regrettable that, um, you know, here's maybe another chance for MDC, do you think, uh, as PJ? Uh, for I the MDC say, to, present, to prevail now as an alliance, a combination of all an, the former an, broken parts. That comes to the point that I wanted to, uh, to say that uh, of the regrets, I thought Miti would come in and say uh, the factionalism, the breakaway that they had in MDC is the one that, called, that killed the movement. Now they are trying to come back, but at the same time, there is also uh, that part of MDC led by... Um, to uh, Ms. Chagwazani Kupe nice. and the one led by Nelson Chamisa. And now um, Mr. Nelson Chamisa is leading the MDC alliance as a coalition right. of the breakaway MDCs. Right. I would have thought that he would delve into that. That was partly, uh, that could be partly the regret uh, that, they, that they have as, a, as an alliance, as a party. Mm -hmm. And also coming to uh, Dr. Moyo. Uh, what took him so long to come back when he left 2002 and now we're talking 2018, no. 10 years or 15 years down the line. Um, talking about ZAN-PF, I would have thought um, Mr. Muchangwa um, would talk about the land issue, but he didn't touch about, uh, upon it. I hope uh, uh, the, one of the, um, the moderators I would ask about the land issue because the land issue is the one that killed Zimbabwe. Okay, uh, absolutely. Well, uh, this is, we just uh, took a little break from the action in Harare where there's a debate, the elected, the presidential debate taking place uh, due to technical issues. The audio quality is a little compromised, so we were just trying to uh, wait for that issue to be resolved, but we're going back to the discussion. To build social capital to bind the people together we have to use the constitution as minimum standards and they do more than the call of duty, so to speak, to build trust. We are coming from a, country, from a, a, a history where I have to say this is why, I mean, I think it's beautiful that Ambassador Mchangwa is representing ZANU because it's the second time I've met him. And I hope that Zimbabweans really look, listen carefully because when you're incapable of admitting your mistakes, you are also incapable of improving. So uh, the, the issue of the constitution, there are countries that have got no written constitution. The question is, do we as a people want to run a society that we can be proud of using con the constitution as a minimum reference point, but doing much more to build belief and credibility of our institutions or not. The culture that ZAN has cultivated and nurtured in the last 38 years is about bossiness, not about servant leadership. They think they are the boss. They don't think that the people are the boss. So if, for instance, there is a constitution, but the people say, actually, 
We are not accepting this. It's, your clock is not working, so I'm not sure what time. <laughs> um, your time is up, time unfortunately. Is up, unfortunately. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Moyo. Okay. Thank you. Uh, interesting that you speak of the admission of mistakes when in your opening, when asked what is your regrettable decision, you said you have none. No, but I didn't no, say no, that. It's, this is a, <laughs> no. I didn't say that you should listen carefully to what I said. <laughs> what did you say, Dr. Moore? I say even the decisions that appear negative, they've left me a wiser person. Noted. Okay. All right, um, let's move to our next round of questions. What we'd like to do, gentlemen, in your answers, we can sense your body language as one candidate responds, another one fidgets, frowns, and uh, scowls if need be, sometimes smiling and nodding. We would like to encourage you to respond to each other. Um, so I know that when we mentioned the ground rules, so to speak, you might have thought it's a bit rigid. We know that you're used to, some of you are used to our form of parliament, for example, where you can speak over each other, but we don't want to keep you too confined. We're going to open it up a little bit. This is the great thing about anything live. We can adjust and adapt. So we're going to allow for a bit of back and forth between you. Um, if you do have a direct response to anything that has been said by one of the other panelists, please feel free to signal and let us know that there's a point of pressure that you'd like to speak to. Um, Dr. Moyo, can I start with you? I, I would like to respond to Ambassador Mpangwa's issue about war veterans. I think this thing is so painful for most Zimbabwean families. Most Zimbabwean families lost people in that war. And they came back. A lot of our relatives did not come back. And they keep going on and on and on as if they own. I think, I think it's regrettable. It's, it's really totally unbelievable that they can go on the way they do. Yeah. Okay, what we will do, I, I hope I haven't created a monster in allowing you to respond to each other, but I'm going to allow for the same format. Our lights, uh, if the audience can also help me be the judge, there are two white lights right now above the monitors on the screen. When they go red, it means your minute is up. So um, with your help as the audience, we will be conducting that. But please do allow each speaker to have their minute before interjecting, if possible. Thank you. Um, Dr. Okay, Moya, I'll allow you to finish say, your point. The people, the war veterans who are alive and are back here, looking after themselves and claiming monopoly over the revolution, are totally misguided. This whole nation went to war. They know that. And most of our people did not come back. And they are not reaping the benefits that they are monopolizing today. And I think it's unforgivable that they're doing what they're doing. And I think they ought to be a bit more humble to understand they are lucky because they came back. A Thank lot you. of our relatives didn't come back. And I think it's so unacceptable that they go on and do what they're doing today. They've hijacked the revolution, and they are alive. They are lucky to be alive. We lost relatives who totally forgotten, and the revolution has been hijacked. Thank you. <laughs> Ambassador. Plain hogwash. This is what it is. Plain hogwash. This is my generation. Equally smart as I was. We never made a decision to go and fight. I went through that when I was a university student. I know the people who died. They were my colleagues. He is now trying to want to speak on their behalf when he was a coward. This is unforgivable on his part. You don't speak about an issue which you didn't participate when you have reason to participate. Period. And if anybody can howl what you went for, what you want in this room, you did not participate in that war. Give those who fought in that war the prerogative to talk about it. People were organized by the war veterans. It was a painful exercise. It was death every day of my life doing that. And I'm now being given lectures by people who were not in that war. I will not accept it. I will go on behalf of those who in any case it's not going to be repeated. It's not like going to school and we're saying I repeat another class. It was done and it was done the way it was it was done. I don't want Thank to be noted. Thank you, Ambassador. I think I'm going to come to our other two panelists on this point and just broaden it a little bit beyond just the issue of war veterans because there is a culture of politics in Zimbabwe where there's a question right now, especially um, I'll speak for my generation, where the question becomes, are our leaders leading us to a politics under Zimbabwe that is best for the Zimbabwean or is politics so individualistic 
where everybody has their hurts, as Ambassador Mchangwa is talking about. Yeah. Everyone has their vision, um, not to take it, anything away from that. But I'll implore the other two gentlemen to guide us away from just about war veterans and speak more holistically, because some generations cannot identify with a war veteran, for example. So uh, first with you, uh, Professor Maduko. I must say that uh, I absolutely agree with what Dr. Moe said, and that um, it's important that we emphasize that uh, this country is not every day about the liberation struggle. I think that's fair. <laughs> that phase is over. I think if there was any reward to be given, 38 days would be enough. <laughs> anyway. It's very important that we get that we are not the only country that had to be liberated from some struggle. Every society has fought a war. Every society has fought oppression. Every society has fought um, injustice. But it is not it is this only society where those that believe they fought injustice. Uh, but from what Dr. Moe said, it's not those who are in Zanu PF who would claim to be a fought injustice. Everyone fought injustice. And every family and every person in Zimbabwe would be part and parcel of a, 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 We would all say we're coming from a war veteran struggle. We are, and for that reason, Why I think that. you identify with it? Can I finish and say that uh, it, to identify is not to it say is I'm Zanu PF. He's confusing being Zanu PF and identifying the ideals of the liberation Thank struggle. You, we are all professor. for it. Thank you, Professor. Mr. Beatty. Any contribution to this portion yes, here? Yes, yeah, definitely. I, I agree with my two colleagues, uh, Dr. Moyo and uh, uh, Prof. Mandela. Which two it's, colleagues, it's, sir? It's a, it's a tragedy that uh, my colleagues like uh, uh, Chris Mchango are still fighting a war that finished 40 years ago. <laughs> that uh, we are beholden to a past, and that past is now a basis of entitlement, a basis of impunity a basis uh, of this strong messianic complex that they hold, that, that uh, we liberated you. Uh, can, can, can you be, can you be? Mm. Ambassador Machanga, please allow uh, Mr. Beatty to finish. Can you be a comrade for once? Can you be a comrade for once? That, that, we, li that we liberated you, uh, and, and, and we say at our public meetings, we say at our public meetings, the same DCI line, that if the abuse we suffer, by those who claim to have liberated us, this goes to the extent of the debasement of our country in the manner that they've done. We can't allow that as a, as a license. Thank you. And so sometimes we say, guys, you old people, if you think you liberated us, go and tie that country again mm -hmm. so that our own generation can liberate it because we are tired of this. Uh, Thank you, sir. You know, terrible. <laughs> I guess uh, job is cheap. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I am. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. 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 Please, please, please. Mr. Please. Mr. Please. Mr. Please. Sorry, if we don't, we if we don't contain hero. this we are now, are now that if we don't contain this now, we are conscious choice. Thank we are fighting yes. black, on, black oppression. No, it's more vicious than white on black oppression. Thank you very much, gentlemen. If we don't contain this now, if we don't contain this now, this debate won't be progressive. All right. I'm going to have no vanilla tea for my colleague. in the room, it is evident from our panel that there might be a need for national uh, healing, healing, peace and reconciliation. Um, so I'll hand over to you now. Well, of course, uh, you all know what happened uh, at least around 1983 in Matevele land. You call it Bukurahunde? Hundi. Bukurahunde. Yes. Please allow for the question to come. Thank you. Do you think, for example, that uh, there is a need uh, for national reconciliation, that uh, you have really to come up with policies uh, that are designed to bring about, uh, uh, you know, a sort of healing, really, when you think about it. Because as I talk to people, um, people keep 
talking about the events of the 1983. You in Zimbabwe, you border with a country that went through uh, something called uh, uh, truth, justice, and reconciliation south of the border, south of Limpopo. Is it possible that perhaps as a nation, you should think first and foremost perhaps about apologizing really to the nation for what happened uh, so that uh, you can move forward. What about you, Ambassador Mushyango? What do you think about that? Look, uh, the, the, the development of any country is not linear. In the process, certain decisions can be made and some of them can be actually wrong decisions and they can be painful to the country. It is the challenge of social development. And in the instance of what you are talking about, certain things happened amongst the people of Zimbabwe, and it is, it, it is a painful chapter, of course, you know, from that aspect. But look, let's look at it in the other context. This, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa was about a colonial and, 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 and anti-apartheid process. Here in this case, it's about the people and babes falling up, uh, out of each other. And these are the painful processes, mistakes which any country could make, which should be avoidable. And once they are made, then they become part of the history of that country. In America, there's a civil war, a terrible civil war. Soon after the Real Revolution in, 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 in seven, I mean, a couple of decades after the Revolution in 1773, that was a mistake on the part of the Americans. But the United Nations today, and America is a democratic nation. So let's, you know, there's nothing wrong with people looking at where they've gone wrong and coming to processes where they come to consensus or to healing about that process. But there's also everything wrong about trying to rub salt into old wounds and revive old wounds persistently. Because you see, if we start in 1983, others would say let's start in 1975, I mean 1965, when the country was thrown into a civil war by Rhodesian So it's a country which has gone through very painful stages of its history. We would want to avoid such mistakes into the future. But let's not try to use the past as a means to build grievances against each other into the future. That Unfor is not nation building. Unfortunately, the time is also best. All right. What about you, Professor Maduku? Do you think that uh, there's a need uh, uh, for national healing, uh, a need for closure, really? Yes, I think that I need to emphasize that uh, issues to do with um, national healing you have to start from the factual position. Is it an issue or is it not an issue that there was Kukurawun? It is an issue because it is an issue we cannot avoid it. It has to be confronted. So first is to recognize that the Kukurawun issue is, a, is an issue. Then secondly, that there must be national healing. But the solution to our national heal healing must start from the premise that the current government is not recognizing that as an issue. They are not. And that I think if you listen to the answer that has been given, it is emphasizing that let's not uh, go up to the past. It's actually an indirect way of saying it is not an issue. So you have to resolve it first. You remove Zanope from office. You get a new government that uh, recognizes that uh, that is an important thing. Then I need to say that in trying to deal with national healing, you actually have to address the differential developmental issues. Most parts of Matabeleland are much you know, worse than any other part of our country. And this is related. You have Gukura Hundi, you have massive underdevelopment in that part. I'm not saying that the country is, is developed elsewhere, but it's massive underdevelopment in, uh, in Matabeleland. So those two things must be connected. You, are, you recognize it, it cannot be recognized by Zanu. Zanu is out, you get a government that brings people together, develops the country in an equal way. That is the way I would see it. What about you, Dr. Moyo? I would like to take a position which combines the two positions. I, I agree, but different interpretation. I think that we as a people 
need to absolutely factually recognize what happened if we're going to learn from it. But I think we need to be very careful, though, not to try to remake the past. For me, I would like my nation to challenge me in building a future where those things cannot happen again. There are only 24 hours in a day. So I think it's important to understand how you deal with the past and what you learn from it in order to build a different future, as opposed to being retrogressive and getting caught up in the past. So it's a bit of a combination of, of the two answers. Mm -hmm. We have to be factual, we have to recognize what happened so we can learn from it and then use it to build a different future. Very interesting. Now, <laughs> Mr. Bitti, in most African countries uh, where groups came to power through successful liberation struggles, you find that uh, people who are in power tend to either feel or behave in a manner that you would characterize, frankly, as uh, uh, having a sense of ownership. And this is not limited to Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe, as a matter of fact, uh, you, yes, used the AK-47, but eventually you had elections in 1980. But you have never changed government since then, since April 18, 1980. There, there is a president in East Africa who went through a liberation struggle, and he says, my army, my money, my oil. And I also recall that uh, Zimbabwean president Robert Gabriel Mugabe at one time said, addressing to then, the then uh, British Prime Minister, Tony Blair, uh, he said, Tony Blair, keep your Britain and I'll keep my Zimbabwe. The question is really, who is the owner of Zimbabwe? As Zimbabwean citizens, meaning they owe allegiance to the state, and therefore they have constitutional rights, inalienable rights, in fact, birthrights. Or are they subjects who have no rights but can be granted privileges by the individual that the individual they basically owe? Allegiance too. That could be a king, an emperor, or a presidential monarch. Who is the primary stakeholder of Zimbabwe? Well, quite clearly, the primary stakeholder has to be the people of, of Zimbabwe, the Wanaanchi, the Wanalawoi. But regrettably, that has never been the case. Uh, we have remained a captive state, run by coercion, run by, by capture, and run by, by, by corruption. And that is why for the past 20 years we've been in the trenches trying to, through democratic means, to have democracy in our, in our, in our country. Mm -hmm. And it feeds into the discussion that. on war veterans which we have had. Uh, mm -hmm. That uh, we have a group of men and women who believe that by virtue of them having participated in the war of liberation, they own this country. Hello, back again from here in Washington, D.C., the Straight Talk Africa studio at the Voice of America. There is a live debate taking place as uh, we speak in Harare, the elected presidential debate, which is a collaboration between the Voice of America and the Zim Papers television network. Shaka Sali is uh, one of the moderators, as is Ruveneko um, Parira Nyatwa. And here in um, the studios of uh, the Voice of America's Straight Talk Africa show are my colleagues from the VOA Zimbabwe service, Ray Choto and uh, Praxelis Jeremiah. And we're also trying to weigh in on the discussion that is taking place so far away. We, I think we do wish we were there. But as we are here hearing this conversation, clearly, Ray, I want to come to you. You know, some of the issues that are really resonating or really igniting the conversation there, it seems to be still this issue of the election fairness, the platform, ZEC, the liberation war, and how the ambassador Mchangwa really seemed to be 
uh, in the, on the defensive and on the, at the attack at the same time. And then, of course, Ms. PJ, I'd like you to address this issue of Gukura Hundi, which is still very, very raw in a lot of people's minds. Well, how do you think this conversation is going? Is it delving into the issues that uh, Zimbabweans care about? Uh, basically, Ndimiyake, it's quite an interesting uh, conversation. Unfortunately, I think time is not enough, really, to get into all the issues mm. that have to be debated. Yes, we have had uh, arguments from Mr. Mtrangwa, uh, mm. you know, being a war veteran, and also, you know, Mr. Beatty saying what is being to the discussion here is something that should have been dealt 40 years ago. I totally agree with you. Coming back to the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission, we've heard complaints from most of the opposition parties who are participating uh, in this election, and we haven't had even a single one single complaint from ZANPF. And people start asking, why is it that ZANPF is not complaining? And you also look at that, it is ZANPF through the president of, the, of Zimbabwe, who is President Emerson Mnangagwa, who appointed the chair of the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission, uh, uh, Justice Priscilla uh, Chigumba. But of course, also we, we know that it was, he appointed, but obviously it had to go through a process which was pretty democratic. The judicial, uh, the, um, the judicial commission had to weigh in, even parliament had to weigh in, narrow it down on the, on the names of not only the chair, but the commissioners as well. So that is always a resonating issue about. So the fact that he makes the final decision on who is the commissioner <coughs> or the chairperson, does it really make, uh, make it a ZANU-PF no, no, choice? The, the, at the end of the day, I think we need to understand the legal processes that are involved in, in picking uh, the commissioners. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the legal uh, fraternity in Zimbabwe, the law society and others, they submit names. And right. it is up to the president to pick the chairperson. Yes. That is not being debated. But I'm just but going he can to look pick here. whoever he wants out of the what you call the final list of candidates that have been vetted, right? Yes. But I know this conversation could go on for a long time, and I really <laughs> <laughs> I don't want us to uh, end up uh, also becoming part of the politicians. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, just, I just wanted to Very say briefly. that uh, briefly that I mean. Okay. The problem with the Zimbabwe electoral, electoral Commission, the way we are seeing it from the opposition, is that it has tried to play the alpha and the omega, omega. of the electoral process. And I need to move on to PJ. I'm so sorry. We have 45 okay. seconds left. Gukura Hundi. Yes, uh, Gukura Hundi. It, it was only touched um, superficially, but it needs uh, some more discussion. That's how I feel. Uh, and also, I was also interested in the entitlement part of the liberation, the liberation issues. Of yes, uh, they still have that entitlement. You can see by the body language, whatever uh, Ambassador Mtongo was saying. Uh, and also Zek, um, but at the same time, I'm divided. It was chosen, Ambassador Mtongo was also saying the, uh, the correct thing, uh, that it was chosen by mm. the parliament itself. And MDC was part of that. Right. Well, it's an ongoing conversation <laughs> that, uh, um, of course, you will continue to um, actually have the privilege of um, hearing the duration of um, when we switch over to the next platform. Currently, you, are, you have been watching the Zimbabwe presidential debate. It's live from Harare. And in just a moment, for our television and radio audience only, we must end our special edition of Straight Talk Africa, but you may now switch over and watch the remainder of the presidential debate on Facebook. Just type in the key words VOA Straight Talk Africa or go to YouTube or voaafrica.com. And as we continue our debate online to our affiliate stations, we thank you for watching and listening. And um, before I say goodbye, I want to acknowledge my in-studio guests. Uh, Ray Choto and Praxedas Jeremiah, and of course I'm Dimyaki Mokalielia. We've been kind of holding the ball here in Washington, and I'd like to say good night to all of you. Mm. Data around the debt, and that there is full compliance with the Public Debt Management Act and the Public Finance Management Act, as well as the Constitution of Zimbabwe. So, in simple Thank terms, mm -hmm. we seek debt. special debate edition of Straight Talk Africa, but you may now switch over and watch Straight Talk Africa on all our social media platforms, including voaafrica.com.
As we continue our debate online to our field stations, we thank you and say goodbye. And remember to get better, not better, Zimbabwe. And let's keep the African hopes alive. There you have it. Um, and now we continue. But farewell to our television audience, as noted, and um, some of our radio audiences. But we do, as we said, encourage you to continue with us on social media. Um, so now we continue with our debate um, on that point as we were going to take the comments from our audience and uh, continue right in that and allow for each of you to respond. Um, thank you to Mr. Beatty. We know that you're going to need much more than two minutes to speak on our economy. In fact, all of you, I noticed Ambassador Mutrangwa shaking his head profusely on some of the points that you were making. Um, please, may I give you the opportunity to rebuttal that? Well, develop this capital. It's not debt. If you can get investment into a country which outweighs all the debt which is talking about, then you move forward. This debt of Zimbabwe, they talk a lot about it because it is still being Britain with the institutions which have never developed anybody in the last 60 years since they were established. IMF, World Bank, this and that. City. We have come as an PF with a manifesto which calls for international private capital to come into Zimbabwe, give international private capital optimal conditions of investment with an educated population, then the debt will be minuscule to the development capacity of Zimbabwe. China never developed because of the IMF or the World Bank which they worship. It didn't. They went to Wall Street, they went to the stock exchange in Tokyo, they went to the Frankfurt Stock Exchange, they went to London Stock Exchange. Private money, 96 trillion US dollars is in private money, sovereign wealth funds, uh, pension funds. This is where the money is. These are companies which develop world for the world. All the brand names which you see, they come from private companies. You give those companies optimal conditions to be in Zimbabwe, the debt is wiped out. This nonsense which has been going on about IMF and World Bank and all this, I just don't buy it. All right. Thank you, Ambassador Mchwango. I'll come to you, uh, Dr. Moyo. Yes. In fact, I mean, I just want to supplement what uh, Mr. Bitu was saying. There are three components to dealing with our debt. The first one is restructuring the debt. We can negotiate with the people we owe money to restructure that debt to allow us to pay it off over a more extended period. Second one is debt relief, as you already pointed out. The third one, which he left out, which is the biggest component of this, is grow our economy so that it has the capacity to pay. Those are the three issues we have to do. Grow our economy, restructure the debt, and get debt relief where it's possible. That's it. Um, just to interrogate those points, Dr. Moyo, on um, the economic growth. If he comes in with a small one, I will give you a bigger one. All right, that's fine. <laughs> I'll allow for you in a moment, Mr. Bt. If you'll just allow me to finish with Dr. Moyo. It's a lot of things. Mr. Bt. And Mr. Bt. And Ambassador Mchangwa, I'm not yet done with Dr. Moyo. So, Dr. Moyo, you speak of economic growth, right? Is it possible for Zimbabwe to generate, and in over what period, to pay back our debt? No, but and restructuring at what cost? No, no, no. So, the, the situation in Zimbabwe is known in terms of our capacity. The reason why the debt is ballooned is because we can't afford to pay. It's like when exactly. Can I, can I, can I, please? <laughs> please so finish it's just, it's just the same way. If you if you go to a bank and you borrow money for a business and the conditions change, you can restructure your debt. But we have to negotiate. We have to have the facts in order to know what is feasible in terms of how far we can stretch our debt in restructuring the term of the debt. And then the rest is up to us in terms of how quickly we can grow our economy. Remember also, Ruveneko, our government is totally blotted. We've got a budget when 91% goes to pay civil servants because we've got a government size which is totally unsuited for the size of country and size of economy. So we can create capacity to actually service our debt. But I can't give you the details because, as you know, they, don't, they run an opaque system. So you are asking for detail. I'm giving you the principles of it: capacity to pay, restructure, debt forgiveness. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Thank I'll you. allow for Mr. Maduku to respond. He hasn't touched on this uh, discussion around. Yes, yes. My my response is very short and simple. 
I know that if you have a new government, which is not the government that has incurred the debt, there will be an automatic environment in which debt relief would be the most, you know, functional thing. So if you remove Zanupe from power, <laughs> this is a clear, it's a very clear, clear political solution. <laughs> if you remove Zanupe from power, you have a new government. The creditors behind this debt would understand the negotiations would be simple, and then you obviously honor the other debt, and that's, I think that will solve. It's a you need a political solution to the national debt. President so, Mnangagwa is way ahead of all these realistic <laughs> solutions. Watch this economy in the next 24 to 36 months. These people, they are belong to the past. All they right. are into the future. It's investment, optimal conditions for investment. Make private capital come to Zimbabwe. Make, make the best use of the, Africa's educated labor force. Produce world-class goods made in Zimbabwe for the global market, then all these things are addressed. Another question that's come from the audience, which I'll tie in with this particular conversation, is that of the youth. The simple question is, what are you offering them? And I'll pose this in line with our economy. We know very much that for a long period of time, the economy of Zimbabwe, if we were to be a layman, has belonged on the streets. And let's be reasonable and honest about that. You talk about Makoro Koza, you talk about money changers, Parod Port, you talk about Mayuthi, they're the ones that actually know the rates, they decide what the percentage will be. They determine where money flows in this country. Not to talk about who's governing them or the mafias or whatever that are alleged to exist, but let's understand those young people, Domaran, that's the population of unemployed but are actually earning a living. They're not unemployed and say that they're sitting doing nothing, they're earning a living running around in this informal economy. So how, and practically speaking, will each of you offer the young people of Zimbabwe a formal way, an honest way of earning a living where they're not watching their back at every street corner and the rate changes daily and that therefore determines what they eat every day? What are you doing for the young people regards our economy? Can I start? By all means. Yes. You know, the, the money which is being uh, traded on the, on the market in Zimbabwe, who earns it? The foreign currency, the biggest earner is tobacco, and I know because I was instrumental to the revival of the tobacco industry in this country. I was ambassador to China. I'm the one who brought the biggest investment which drives this economy today, 1.6 billion US dollars every, every year. You know, the, in, in February, the governor of the Central Bank is smiling. September, he's swooning because of the rich tobacco industry. My, our parents, our hard credit I had working farmers in that currency. The Korokosas who are now the gold panels, who used to be gold panels, chased by the dogs. I was at the MMCZ as chairman. I said, why are you criminalizing people who are doing an age-old industry for Zimbabwe? We used to produce the biggest gold in the, in the 13th century, in the whole world. That's how we build great Zimbabwe. Now they are legit. Now they are earning foreign currency. That's second. Chrome, we had a whole stupid government of Mugabe. Stopping the sale of st selling, stopping the trade in chrome at a time when the biggest building boom in the world by China was going on. No ounce of Zimbabwe chrome in all those buildings and bridges in China. That's why we are poor. That's where the foreign currency is. What happens to it? It goes to the central bank. It is allocated to everybody who is wearing a suit and saying I'm a businessman. Those people are the ones who earn the currency. Those are the ones who should be allowed to keep their currency and not allow it to be traded because they earn it. Not all these people whom they are talking about, they are free for us to this economy because they are not earning hard currency. Investment is the way we should move forward. Make the economy open, let capital come in, let it use, utilize the most educated labor force on the African continent. A labor force which has proved itself when it goes to other countries. It earns hard currency. Why can't they earn any hard currency at home? It's because Mugabe and everyone was being stupid. That's why we removed Mugabe. That's why we don't have a sense of entitlement which somebody was referring to earlier on. We removed Mugabe because he was stealing entitled. That's why we don't listen to prior people who ask prior. We, we listen to people who make decisions. Finally, we are the only, the first ever liberation movement in the world which, was, which had won a war which decided to go through the ballot box. That's why all these people are now Democrats. 
It will be Vietnam or Cuba or China who will have become a Leninist state. We refused. We went the democratic Thank way. You. People don't want to give credit for a democratic movement, which is wrong. Thank you very it's much. Sad. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm not yet completely answered on the youth, but I hear where it touches on it, where you talk about the central yeah, the money. The yes, yes, they should keep it. Yeah, That's what even I'm though saying. we can't access this currency. Yeah. But, um, let's come to Professor Maduko. Um, there's a question here that also came on governance. And you touched upon it when you were talking in your introduction about how um, there, needs to be, um, a governance, a gov there needs to be a governance structure that people respect, a clean one, as you said. Now, in terms of selecting leadership that will give the young people of Zimbabwe an opportunity, Ambassador Mtrongo, being the leading pa uh, part of the ruling party, talks of $1.6 billion in tobacco coming in annually. How are the young people feeling the benefits of that $1.6 billion? How are you going to ensure that your governance structure implements the needs of the young people and that the young Zimbabwean can appreciate these 1.6 billions and all of that that comes in from um, a project such as tobacco? Thank you. I think it's important for us to stress that uh, young people must be incorporated in any economic processes and in the governance of the country. First and foremost, there is education and skills uh, training that the youth would need. That would be the first line. The skills training would have to channel them so that they focus on what the economy is doing. The second thing is, of course, job creation. And the job creation is part and parcel of the overall framework of economic development trust. Whatever the economy does in agriculture, in mining, in tourism, infrastructure development, you have to ensure that uh, they create jobs. I mean, that would be the immediate thing that any young people would require. And then, of course, thirdly, there has to be a deliberate process of ensuring that young people are encouraged to be in business. They are encouraged to get into investment. And these investment opportunities must be created by the state. And the state creates investment opportunities for the young people through deliberate policies that are simply said young people projects, young people grants, young people access. And that is what we will try and do. Interesting there you talk about skills creation. Respectfully, uh, Professor Madhu, there are so many young people that are overqualified for many jobs in this country. education, skills. To be fair, this 94% unemployment of young people in Zimbabwe is a serious statistic. And um, you talk of skills creation, but what more skills do you need when some people are sitting with degrees but doing nothing? And then you talk about encouraging young people. You also talk about policies, the correct policies. Tell us what these policies are. That's our question. So that young people can buy into your vision and understand what you will be different with. There were many young people's projects that were offered. Remember, if you remember, there was the Kurera Okondla Fund a few years ago. Government has, in the past, tried to support young people, but it has not always come to fruition. What would you do differently? Well, I think first I would not entirely agree that there is already enough skills to everyone. I think that it would be an oversimplification to say that every young person has the skill and that the unemployed, there are so many young people without skills and there are so many people that uh, when we say unemployed, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, if you have no skill, you ought not to be gainfully engaged in other things. So obviously, if you are not skilled already, we have to get into skills. Then get into your point of which policies ought to be pursued. I think you must not uh, uh, under, underestimate the fact that what has led to the massive unemployment and the massive lack of access by young people is corruption. We already have facilities where our young people can be involved in mining projects. They're not doing that because government officers who are there, they are busy taking out uh, what ought to be for the people. So it's, it's not a question of we inventing uh, the wheel. That's why I said that uh, we want to provide a clean government. A clean government simply manages what we have in the country at the moment, and that will provide the opportunity. You cannot get skills without capital, because the, most of the skills which we are in the world today, they belong to Samsung, they belong to Huawei, they belong to Siemens. That's thank what you need. Then we can develop skills. I need thank you, Ambassador. Yes. I'm going to come to Mr. Moyna as we close this round. Um, and uh, come to you, Mr. Moy, on yes, this question yes, yes, um, yes. that has been brought up here from love, uh, um, uh, Professor Maduku talking and continuing on that um, with young people and the selection of, um, of how they're going to receive the benefits and the policies. Um, I'd like you to speak to that. Uh, okay. thank, thank you, and thanks yeah. for asking the question because I think it's the most 
single most important question then that this nation has to answer. Yes. So there are a couple of things we need to recognize. ZAN has run a country for almost 40 years, and I've been around the country talking to young people. Most of the 40 year olds have never worked. They actually don't know what work is in terms of employment. The damage is unbelievable. So our challenge is not just our challenge is not just providing them gainful employment. It's rehabilitation, how you get them into a state of employability in the first place. Huge issue. But on the gainful employment side, let's not just look at being employed. There is entrepreneurship on the one side. So government has to put in place facilities to support entrepreneurs in terms of capitalization of their ideas. So that's one component. The second component is industry re-establishes and gears up. We need to take, because that takes time. It will take anything, 12 months, 18 months, even 24 months, for industry to re-establish themselves. In that time, we as a country have to come up with social programs to literally rehabilitate young people who are on substance abuse, prostitution, all of those things. We've got huge social damage. So we have to put in place social programs for national service, in my, in my opinion. Not military, but social service to help them come away from the habits that they developed and prepare them for employability as industry ramps up. That's what we have to do. But in that time to support the prof here, Professor Maduku, theoretical training, theoretical uh, qualifications are not the same as skills. So during that time, we have to consult with the people investing in this country where they need skills most. And so in the time of rehabilitation of the youth, we then have to put in place programs to make them ready for employment, imparting skills Thank in that time. Thank you, you very much. much. And, uh, we, 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 Thank you very we much. We proven labor product in this country. Get El Zimbabwe into a foreign country where foreign currency, where, where capital is allowed to thrive. They do well. So as a sample of this population in Australia, in South Africa, in England, Zimbabweans do well. Why are you doubting the capacity of Zimbabwean educational system? It is proving itself elsewhere. Thank the you. main yes. thing is to bring capital into this country. Thank you, and Gabe and El did not know the value of capital. And yes, that's indeed. why we removed him. Thank in you. Yes, indeed. Uh, Thank you, Ambassador. Yes. <laughs> uh, so we're going to have to do some. We need to do the ground rules again? Yeah, well, we yeah. To? Well, I guess... Uh, <laughs> um, one of the things that perhaps we really haven't uh, touched on is corruption. And uh, Ambassador Michonga, you rightly said that uh, one of the single most important decisions that uh, your government, your party, has made is education. Yeah. Education, and you're right. You are obviously uh, one of the few countries in Africa, and, and in fact globally, when it comes to education. But there are critics also who say that uh, there is also somewhere else which is not particularly positive, negative, where you have succeeded in the last 38 years. And that uh, you have actually succeeded in institutionalizing corruption and impunity. How do you react to that? Exactly what you said. That's why in November we removed the the person who was responsible for that corruption and impunity. I mean, the, the moment you even get to imagine that your wife can become a successor in a country which was fought for, where she was not there, then, you, then there's something, that's the worst form of corruption at political level. But look, there's institutional corruption. I've given you an example already. Why do the people who earn the hard carriers of this country not be allowed to use it themselves? It goes to the central bank, the central bank allocates it to a few uh, monopoly, and then they start distributing it. And we have all these industries asking every day, we want foreign currency. To raise, to be a businessman means to go to the capital markets in New York, in London, in, in Tokyo, raise your money, and take risk on that capital. All the businessmen here, they don't do that. They go and apply to the reserve bank and get an allocation. Who then is the businessman? It's the central bank governor, because he's one who is taking the risk. But taking the risk with whose money? The money from the Makorokosas, the money from the tobacco farmers, the money from the chrome earners. That's what is wrong about this economy. 
people who should who want to buy fuel, they should go and get their money on the cap on the market, not go to the court the central bank. That's what institutionalizes corruption. People don't challenge it because they all have this Rhodesian economy in their heads. Most of these people, we comrades, we those who fought in the war, we look outside the box. That's why we change government. That's why also we want to change the model. That's why we removed the Mugabe to change the economic model which was doing. And you are going to see the results with our new government. I am not going to be bothered about all this IMF nonsense and all that stuff. We make Zimbabwe ideal for private capital, let investors come, give them the optimal conditions, make the best use of Zimbabwe skilled labor force, educated labor force, produce world-class goods made in Zimbabwe for the global market, make knife fill at home in Zimbabwe. Make Siemens feel at home in Zimbabwe. Make Huawei feel at home in Zimbabwe. Unfortunately, then you get skills. Then you get not training skills. How do you train skills? Mr. Basada, the economy which has never been grown. Unfortunately, you never have skills. Time, you get skills from those who have acquired. Time is not done well on the global market. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, sorry. Can I just make a, an observation? Yes, please. The ambassador here is not aware that most serious global businesses will not come into this country unless we've got a relationship with the IMF and the World Bank. That's and not and true. That is, yeah. That's yeah. not true. Let's, yeah, well, that is simply not true. Let me, uh, let me come in. Uh, uh, Wrong you, education from the Western countries. Professor Maduku, <laughs> pro, I think he has a point. Uh, Professor Maduku, you obviously heard what uh, the ambassador said about corruption, and he was... It was very, I think, uh, good enough, uh, at least to admit that uh, his party, frankly, has been on the wrong side uh, of uh, uh, the corruption issue. But what about also those who say that if you talk about corruption, the mother of corruption, in fact, happens to be electoral injustice. And that unless you deal with these electoral injustice, you have no moral authority to fight these other systems of corruption. Yes, I, I, I think I, I agree. But let me first say that uh, from listening to Ambassador Mtangu, we must see, be clear. You cannot say that President Mugabe was running a one-man or a one-person government. And that uh, once you say that... Um, once you describe Mugabe We removed him, Mugabe. We please. know what was wrong with please, him. Please, please, oh, please. Come on. Order, Mr. Basa. This, this thing has been recycled the whole night by everybody here. You were once a soldier and you said it to us, uh, you know, for a soldier, the key is display. Yes. It's not... <laughs> the, yes, I, I the think... The main thing about democracy is not to be bombarded by three people on the same person the whole night as if they are um, in, in, in an inquisition. This but, is the same argument repeated by everybody of the two of them. Well, but let's, please, let, can please, I proceed? Let's proceed I think, let me proceed. Yes, he has please. repeated his main point from point one is to say we removed Mugabe. Which and then true. to distance the administration of President Mnangagwa from the administration of President Mugabe. That cannot be. It's not possible politically, it's not possible legally, it's not possible in any way. They are part and parcel of the same. So in saying Mugabe. Fail. Then let the people they choose fail. on Monday. Let the people choose please, on Monday. Please. They will decide only what you are please. saying. Well, we, we have to, please. So I, I, I would say that um, the issues related to electoral theft or electoral malpractices is correct. It is something that has to do, from our perspective, it, it is a huge project. It's the difference between us and others has been the ZEC issue. The issue here, let, let's go to resources to do an election, for example. You get um, the current president who is the candidate using helicopters to address 15 rallies in a day. Hmm. You get the rest of us Red driving does, in America bed. does the same thing. UK does the same thing. What's new here? That's not true. But that's where... If you do, in Cambridge, if you, you, do you have to pay for it. Cambridge. You have to pay for it from your, yeah. from your party pocket. No, everyone yes. is incumbent, uses incumbent no. to be in charge. No, no. <laughs> May I complain that? Now we that get everybody who is walking in the street who wants to be a candidate. He wants a helicopter. You see, <laughs> no, Mr. Ambassador, Mr. Ambassador, Mr. Ambassador, you are right like everyone else really to be entitled no, to let's, your let's, different types of opinion. Let's talk about things which But certainly not your different sets party. of facts. But surely you have to... You're have making a... this argument frivolous now. Please. Please. 
I, I think he has a reason to do that because he has to shield himself from the obvious facts that are coming out because they are important points. That, yes, you cannot, you cannot have a situation where you have a completely unbalanced mm. environment. Mm. And then the reason why he keeps on saying, let's wait for money, he knows that uh, they are using a completely unbalanced So don't way. participate then. Why mm. are you talking about democracy? Uh, if Please on Monday you don't believe in the election. Please let me finish. We Mr. haven't reached that. We are participating in the democratic process to build so our respect the rules. We will not give up in our struggle to get this country more democratic. <laughs> we are just... Uh, <laughs> So for that reason, it has to be addressed. That framework, they do not have the moral authority. I think that to challenge. It will be very clear that you cannot divorce the administration of President Mugabe from the administration. It's not that true. Is we are not the same. And that when we say 38 years, and he has we not removed, denied. We removed that, the 38 uh, years in November. We did. I won't you be able didn't. To, to continue because thank you. Very, yeah, thank you very yeah, much. Ah, you know, you repeat now, the same thing over Ms. and over. Mr. Bitti. We removed him. You Mr. didn't. Bitti. All of you failed. And even if we are give you to give you a chance, you still failed because you have never done anything please. to achieve anything in your life. We Mr. did. Mr. Ambassador, right, please. Gentlemen, just a please. reminder, oh. Ambassador Mutangwa, we do not in any way uh, shun your passion for the country and what you need to say. But I must reiterate that everybody in this room is passionate. The fact that they left their homes and their jobs to be here means they're passionate about their country and they want an equal opportunity then to you, hear you from don't all dispari the Then you don't disparage the Ambassador passion Ambassador of the others, Ambassador particularly Ambassador if it is steeped in faith. Ambassador Tonga, respect you. Yes. Please allow for all the candidates to speak as they desire yes. and we will give you every opportunity yes. to rebuttal. There's been but one consistent statement. Mugabe is Mugabe. is Mugabe. He is not. Thank you, Ambassador. That's why you have to run away. I think everybody knows the difference between uh, Robert Mugabe and uh, President A world Trump. of a difference. There we go. Um, thank you very much. Now, over to um, Mr. Bichi. I believe you were trying yes. to make your point. No, no. You had to ask me a question. Yeah, what I actually Sorry. wanted to ask you, uh, Mr. Bichi, is that uh, you, we talk about electoral injustice. You won last time, uh, at least according to you and a lot of others, uh, back in 2008. You were not uh, declared victors. You subsequently had an election in 2013, and uh, you lost that election, uh, at least uh, by every indication. And you're going to be competing in another election next week, and yet you do not seem, you do not actually seem to have respect or com you don't seem to have confidence in the Zimbabwean Electoral Commission. I'm sure you are aware of uh, a very, very intelligent man uh, by the name Albert Einstein, who once said that uh, if you continue doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results, it must be insanity. Are we talking about political insanity here or electoral insanity? Well, you, you cannot blame the victims. We have been the victims of electoral fraud. Zimbabwe, since independence uh, in 1980, uh, 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 we have had an average of an election in every uh, uh, four years. We have had about uh, uh, you know, uh, 12 elections, but none, none of those elections have delivered. But it's not unique for Zimbabwe. It's the story in Africa across the world. Most of Africa. We are victims of an electoral authoritarianism. A process where you go through normative electoral processes, but substantively there is no change. And the system is designed to reproduce the, the odious rule of the, of the status quo, of the incumbents. And that's what we, are, we, are, we, 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 we go through in Zimbabwe. In most developed countries, in most open societies, Elections are fraught with the outcome uncertainty. You don't know who is going to win. In, pla in captured places like Zimbabwe, you don't have outcome uncertainty. You've got procedural uncertainty. Rules that are bent and twisted at every, 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 every turn. You have coercion. You have, the, you have fear. And that's what we are going through. So we don't trust the Zimbabwe Election uh, uh, Commission. Uh, we don't trust that... Uh, the system, even if it wanted to, is capable of running a free, fair, legitimate, credible election. But we participate in this election. The reason why we participate in this election is that, number one, it's our democratic uh, uh, right. 
we fought for it. Our fathers fought for it. Our mothers fought for it. Uh, the key essence of the liberation struggle was one man, one foot, one person, one foot. So we, we fight to accept uh, that uh, that right. That's why we are participating mm. uh, on the 20, uh, on the 30th of July 2018. But I want to say that I want to say that I want to say that you keep on asking about doing the same thing. In the past, we've rushed to courts when they stolen the election. This time around, we will be in the streets, and this time around, this country will not be governed. Very interesting, <laughs> Dr. Moyo. Dr. Moyo, uh, the Zimbabwean Electoral Commission has uh, promised uh, a credible election. Do you believe that um, the ZEC is capable of delivering a free, fair, transparent, credible, and verifiable election? Or is it going to boil down to um, an election result which probably does not reflect the will of the people, but probably reflects the will of the people who count the vote or the individual who announces the result? Okay. So I'm going to try and combine your previous question with your current question. The simple answer about that is that they're not credible. All their behavior says to you, it's flashing red all over the place in terms of their behavior. So there is no credibility whatsoever. But I think what we should not make a mistake about, however, is that it does not follow that they, they will get their, what they want simply because they behave this way. Zimbabweans have also wised up in terms of how to try and protect the result. Firstly, the numbers that are registered to vote are significant. And if more of these people who register to vote turn up and vote, playing around with the results becomes more, more difficult. Not impossible, but more difficult. There are a couple of things which we also need to notice about what is different now compared to the previous elections, because you asked that question. What is done this year? There are many of them. I think that the people of this country this year are going to protect, be protected by ZANU defeating itself. So it's a very important issue that is different in answering your question about Einstein. It's repeating the same thing, but under very different circumstances. And the result is likely to be different. Thank you very much. All right. Um, in, closing, in closing, we'd like to um, offer you your uh, final words as we conclude our debate this evening. Um, and I'll just direct uh, the key points that we'd like you to touch on. Uh, Mr. Beatty, I would like to come to you on this one, on corruption. Um, it's been a rampant issue, and uh, my question to you would be, for those who are considered corrupt um, in uh, the country right now, whether they're in government, whether they're in business, um, how are you going to make sure that they're brought to book? Um, the ruling party has uh, also made commitments of dealing with corruption, but we haven't seen any subsequent arrests since November. There were talks of uh, you know, targeting criminals around uh, former President Mugabe, but there haven't been any substantial arrests made. I'm not sure if they're still investigating. I don't know. Not to ask you to speak for them, but what would the MDC do for the people of Zimbabwe to see that the Chokwadi corruption has been dealt with? Mbava Zasuma. For, for Zanupiev to be expected to deal with uh, corruption, he's expecting a mosquito to cure malaria. <laughs> <laughs> Coming to your more specific question. Number one, we intend to ensure that there is a asset disclosure by every public officer. So you disclose your asset at the beginning of the year. We intend to make the prosecution department, the NPA, very strong, very independent, so that they can make independent decisions on the prosecution. We intend to empower the Zimbabwe Revenue Authority with power to conduct lifestyle audits. You see people building houses on mountains, which scientifically it is impossible to build because they've stolen our diamonds and so forth. So we intend to empower the Zimbabwe Revenue Authority uh, with power to, to, to carry out uh, audits, uh, lifestyle audits. Number four, the biggest corruption that has taken place in Zimbabwe is diamonds. We intend to set up an international judicial commission of inquiry over the theft and loss of our diamonds in the past uh, five, six years. Number six, we intend to uh, uh, strengthen 
the anti-corruption commission. By its very nature, uh, uh, it's supposed to be an independent commission, a chapter 13 commission, we intend to, to, to strengthen it. But most importantly, we want to create incentives uh, against corruption. One of the reasons why there's so much corruption in Zimbabwe is because it's, it's a dysfunctional economy, it's a dysfunctional state. Build a functional state with the jobs, with investment, with full employment, and you reduce the incentive for people cutting corners and people uh, taking a uh, crime into their own hands. Thank you. So building a functional state will be key. Thank you, Mr. Biti. Um, to you, Dr. Moyo, um, your campaign has been uh, called by some quite elitists in terms of how you launched at the Nichols Hotel last year and how you subsequently dealt with your campaign not doing mass rallies, not doing giveaways, but speaking with people one-on-one. -on -one. If you become president, Dr. Moy, how are you now going to engage with the masses? So, <laughs> so, so it's, it's actually very interesting, Ruben, that you think that uh, not holding a rally is elitist. I have met more ordinary people than any of these people because I've gone to the people. I've not called them into a gathering. I've gone to where they are and met them in their circumstance. That is not elitist. So I, I, I will continue to meet people the way I'm doing now. When I become president, when, not if, when I become president, once a month, unannounced, I'll turn up in some part of Zimbabwe to continue to engage with Zimbabweans in their lived reality. Because that's the only way you can manage a system. You have to experience it, you have to know it, not live in some ivory tower. You have to travel the roads, not pave the roads to your house. You have to travel on the roads that people travel. That's what I would say. Thank you, Dr. Moyo. All right, and to Professor Manduku, um, you are known for your strong defense of the law. Um, is a revised constitution top on your agenda if you become president? Yes. And which points in particular, if you were to name two, would you reform, to push to reform this within the constitution? Yes, I'm sorry that I had almost uh, no gone problem. before you had finished. Yes, yes, yes. In fact, that is the top most, in fact, that is the reason, a uh, main reason why we decided to become a political party. We believe that the main problem here in this country is the concentration of power in the hands of the president. In fact, you should link it to the question that you posed uh, to Tendai earlier on to do, deal with the corruption. Here, my experience in this country is that the corruption has been on the basis of protection by the president. We got President Mugabe out, and then we have a new president. Currently, even when you get to, there are people that are surrounding the president that uh, would, I think they, they would deserve to be arrested but they are surrounding the president. So the problem we have is a constitutional framework that whoever becomes president will on day one become powerful because of what the constitution provides. And that you have to deal with. I imagine now that before we had president, you thought it was about uh, Gushungo, but immediately you got uh, President Nangagwa in his ED and everything else. It's everything's around. And that is my biggest passion, that we must allow Zimbabweans now, they are wiser with what we have gone through, to have a new process within five years of a, an NCA government. You will have you. a real democratic constitution. Thank you very much. And uh, in closing, Ambassador Mutrangwa, I chose you last deliberately because no one's going to interject you. Um, so, um, Ambassador, on the question of the outcome of the elections, if ZANU-PF wins, and you stay in power for another five years. <laughs> how, how, I mean, I've been doing interviews, this is my second election doing such interviews and debates, and I found that in selecting panels, it's the same faces all the time, the same names all the time, since five years ago. And that's actually across the parties, not just in ZANU-PF. My question, Ambassador, is how is ZANU-PF going to create seats at the table for young people and for women, actively, because it is quite tiresome to see the same names on rotation in the same offices, the same businessmen buying the latest cars, and um, it is important for young people to understand where their future is, regards a seat at the table. This is the second time around I'm involved in major changes. For the last three years, I could hardly live with my family. My son was in jail every weekend, my, my, my eldest son. 
being charged all sorts of things. I know the pain of change second time around. When I listen to what I'm hearing about this and that from this group here, I realize they are far removed from the realities of the, of the elections on Monday. And the people of Zimbabwe being much more serious by, than the political goons, gunmanship, <laughs> which I'm hearing. They are going to choose the part which is serious, and they are going to be with ZANU-PF. We are given to rule because of the folly and the vacuousness of our adversaries. Young people in November identified with the, the church, and I was central to that movement. I know where they were. That's why when I called for 2 point something million people to Harare, they came. There was, there was a vibe. There was a vibe. You know, you see, everybody came. You, you have never done anything in your life except to, to grow. So on Monday, on Monday, people of Zimbabwe will vote. And ZANU-PF ZANU -PF will be in power, and these people will be complaining the same way they've done over and over again. Some are I'll, repeat, to rule. I'll repeat my question yes. for young people having a seat at the table. Your own son wanted to run for ZANU PF, but he did not find that he was accepted by the system because he's a young I man. Was, I also so had similar problems. We, we are aware. And that has been a question that came in to say for your own personal case. But again, this will extend. You but know, what I want to just hear from you as ZANU PF you know, ambassador, you, you know, what are you going to you give know, the young people you as know, an opportunity as to participate? What I'm trying to say, I cannot put. I went through the process of building, of, of, being, of build, the build up of an army. There were challenges which are so painful about that process. I've lived with this kind of thing. Nothing is done on a platter and nothing is given free. You have to struggle for it all the time. If you are going to think that something is going to come from somebody, from somewhere, you don't get it. But you go to get, and you go to be in sync with the population. The young people of today of Zimbabwe, they are heavily involved in politics for the first time in 37 years. It's a good sign. And I'm going to encourage that. And uh, even if they become independent or whatever, it's a good thing. It's the vibrance of democracy. I have no quarrel with that. Thank you very much, uh, Shaka Sali. I think our job here is done. Really? It is. Um, gentlemen, I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to give us the opportunity to hear from each of you and the parties that you represent. Ambassador Mutrangwa, Professor Maduku, Mr. Miti and Dr. Moyo. Thank you very much. From us um, representing ZTN and of course Shakasali representing VOA, it has been a very interesting collaboration to bring this platform together and we thank all the stakeholders that made this day possible. All the people that participated, to all of you in the room, a very big thank you to you for being here with us this evening. Thank you. Um, thank you. Please the, remain seated. Of July on Monday we encourage you all to go in your numbers and vote peacefully um, and we wish you all the very best may the best man or woman win thank you thank you please remain seated as we ask our guests to leave the room and our anchors please remain seated as we ask our guests oh god <laughs> please remain seated please sir remain seated Please remain seated. Please remain seated. Please remain seated. The security details will follow after they leave the room. Please remain seated. Please remain seated, Chowad. Thank you.